Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are super excited about today's topic and we'll get started in just one more moment. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're giving everyone just one more moment to sign on, but we'll get started in just one more minute. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Allison Weiss and I'm the Associate Director of Corporate and Executive Education at the Brown School of Professional Studies. At the Brown School of Professional Studies, our mission is to empower you with the resources, skills, and network that you need to change the way the world works for good. We all know that we tend to spend over 50% of our lives at work. And so the way that we show up at work for ourselves and for others makes a huge impact on productivity, creativity, and also mental well being. And that is why we are so passionate about offering you a portfolio of different programs that cover the most in demand skills for yourself, your teams, and your organizations in a format that fits into your busy schedules. Whether you're looking for a master's degree, a certificate, a short course, or a free masterclass like you've come to tonight, we have something for you that will fit into your career goals. And at the end of today's session, we'll talk a little bit about how you can learn more about this topic. But in the meantime, I'm really excited to hand things over to our incredible speaker today. And I think today's topic on harnessing creativity could not be more timely. I think at the end of the year with the holidays coming up, it can often be a time where we're feeling a little bit like we're burning the candle at both ends and we're feeling a little burnt out, a little exhausted. And having the opportunity to take a step back, have this bird's eye view of thinking about what it would look like to end the year on a really high note can be such an incredible way to set ourselves and our teams up for success ending this year and starting the next year. My last piece of housekeeping before I hand things over to our incredible speaker is that if you have a question, please submit it throughout. Don't wait until the end. And we'll take questions through the Q&A box. So if you look at the bottom bar of Zoom, you'll see a Q&A button. Click on the Q&A button and type and submit your questions there. And I'll be keeping an eye on them throughout. So with that, I'm really excited to introduce and hand things over to our incredible speaker, Mike Graninetti. Mike Graninetti is the, an adjunct professor at the School of Engineering at Brown University. He's a veteran Silicon Valley engineer and McKinsey consultant in the past, and he was the chief of operations for eight different startups. So for him, when he's teaching these types of skills like innovation, creativity, he has um, a segment on chat GPT, it, he always has a focus on the application. We're never spending too much time talking about theory or vocab words. We're always thinking about what it actually looks like in practice. And on top of it, he's also an incredible and experienced teacher. He has affiliations with MIT, Harvard, Berkeley, and Brown, just to name a few, and has gotten a ton of positive feedback on his courses throughout. So with that, I'm really excited to hand things over to you, Mike. Thank you for being here with us today. Allison, thank you, as always, for your very warm introduction. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I hope those of you who are calling in from the Eastern Seaboard are staying dry. Um, <clears throat> And of course, what we're hoping to do tonight is give you a preview of some of the content from for the upcoming Innovation Leadership Executive Certificate course. And it's impossible to discuss innovation without also including the notion of creativity. Creativity tends to be somewhat understood, right? This is not just the province of an artist, not just the province of someone who you know goes to work each day making film uh, doing photography painting theater creativity is something that is relevant to all of us okay and so i'm going to quote here seneca the younger uh, a polymath from the roman empire who was a philosopher a strategist a dramatist 
um, and whose teachings are as relevant today as they were um, when he first began to write them. And one of the things that he says that really captures it for me is everything is the product of one universal creative effort. Think about when you go to a concert or a play or you see a film. I think about the first time I saw Hamilton on Broadway and how that creation had such an incredible effect on me personally, on my soul, this connection to it. So there is a network of creative DNA that we all share. And so today, what I want to do is I want to put this, as Allison said, into practical terms. I want to ask the question, why does creativity matter in business? How have so many of us lost our creative confidence? Why do so many leaders go out of their way to kill creativity in the workplace? And then let's turn it around. How do we reclaim our creative confidence as individuals? How do we exercise creativity in teams and at scale? And of course, I would be remiss in the age of generative AI to not discuss how we are entering a new age of human creativity brought to us by generative AI. So I don't think it's a surprise to any of you, right? The, the world that we are living in is chaotic on a good day. You may know the acronym VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and moving at warp speed. And so the challenge for companies is to remain innovative, to remain relevant over time. And yet very few companies are able to stay on this golden trajectory, this regenerative trajectory where they're able to reinvent themselves constantly across product life cycles, across economic cycles, across generations. The vast majority of companies are those that are on a degenerative trajectory, one hit wonders, companies that don't have the will to disrupt themselves. And so of course, all of us wanna be working for or leading companies that make the world's most innovative company list. And so why would we want to do that? Well, very simply, the companies that are the most innovative are always the most successful. Just a couple of days ago, the Wall Street Journal introduced their most recent top 250 managed American companies. Um, and as you look at some of the, the data, not surprisingly, the companies that are the most successful dramatically outrank their peer group on innovation, including job postings for cutting edge occupations. And they also outrank them on employee engagement and employee development overall. And this, of course, leads to that virtuous cycle of customers are very, very happy, right? So it's a very positive reinforcing cycle. What I want people to understand is creativity is not separate from innovation. It is an absolutely critical input to innovation. So imagine that creativity is the input and societal change is the output. Now, let me quote Sir Ken Robinson. We're gonna hear from him in a, in a minute yet again, but his message is innovation is applied creativity. And by definition, innovation is always about introdu introducing something new or improved. And let's go to a couple of examples of new and improved. Let's go back to 1983, and let's think about an incredible breakthrough in the personal computing um, cycle. When Steve Jobs was just launching Apple Computer, and he saw the way that the Microsoft at the time operating system and other uh, personal computers were incredibly challenging to use, right? It was all about command line programming. And he had a very famous moment of epiphany when he took a tour at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center in California and saw something called the graphical user interface. And so he, in that moment, said, I have seen the future of computing. It's not about command line programming. It's about imagery. And this is the, the screen, the graphical user interface of the famous Lisa computer that was introduced in 1983 and really was the predecessor to the Macintosh and even to the iPhone that we see today. Okay, He just completely imagined a new paradigm and it changed the world. 
And then if we fast forward to the launch of the original iPhone, you had Jobs on stage in 2007 and saying, if we look at the existing smartphones, they're really not that smart and they're not that easy to use. And once again, Jobs was able to imagine a completely new, completely different approach to what a smartphone might be. And two and a half billion iPhones later, a multi-trillion dollar market cap later, we have seen two poetic examples of what it means to reimagine the world. But it doesn't stop at the idea. Jobs was relentless working with his teams to make sure that these ideas found their way into the marketplace and started to make dramatic changes in the way that we work and the way that we live. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say the iPhone, more than any other product, created this digital world that we all live in today. And so creativity feeds innovation, which is the implementation phase of success. IBM goes out every year and they survey 5,000 CEOs. What are the most important leadership qualities that you would expect to have? Creativity comes in at number one. Why? Because creative leaders are willing to make more changes to business models, which we know we have to do on a regular basis in this dynamic environment. They're willing to cannibalize themselves and invite disruptive innovation. They're comfortable with ambiguity. And like the Wall Street Journal um, ranking I just shared with you, they tend to score much, much higher on the innovation league table, which means they're going to be more successful companies. So why do we then lose creative confidence? And so let's go back to Ken Robinson. What's amazing is that Sir Ken Robinson gave a TED Talk in January of 2007. That is almost 17 years ago. And this TED Talk remains 17 years later as the single most viewed, viewed YouTube video in history. And the title of the TED Talk is Why Schools Need to Embrace Kids' Creativity. And one of the important quotes in it was, creativity is as important as literacy. And I think many of us know what it's like when you're in a traditional school environment where there's a strong amount of pressure to not question and to conform. And so the Kelly brothers, famous for the creation of the world-class product design and innovation consultancy known as IDO, and the people behind the Stanford Design School say people who believe they lack creativity often insist, I can't draw, as if somehow just the ability to draw is a litmus test for people to say, oh my God, I'm just not that creative. And I can tell you from experience as a professor who teaches in a lot of executive ed, has spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, has worked with a lot of people that work in the world of innovation, they are really lacking in creative confidence. And so it leads to people having ideas, but they don't have the confidence to implement those ideas. And so if you've never heard of the Marshmallow Challenge, it's a remarkably uh, telling challenge. You have an 18-minute time period, and the goal is simple. You ask the participants to form small teams, and to build the tallest free standing structure they can. And they're given some very specific materials, 20 sticks of spaghetti, three feet of tape, three feet of string and a marshmallow. And the marshmallow must be on top. And I will tell you, if you've never been a part of this, these are really fun things to witness. And, and of course, the real question is, so who are the, the experts? Who are the, uh, the legends of the marshmallow challenge? Well, let me tell you who they're not. They're not CEOs, they're not lawyers, and they're not MBAs. Who they are, are kids, five-year-old kids who have not yet had their creativity extracted from their souls. And this has been repeated again and again and again. So how do we re 
recharge, reinvigorate our creative DNA. Okay. Now, unfortunately, we go into the workplace and it's just as bad. Larry Bossidy, who was the vice chairman of GE, the CEO of Chrysler and Honeywell, said something that I just find to be remarkably real. There is a very fine line between being an entrepreneur, that being an entrepreneur within a large corporation, and being insubordinate, which is a military firm a term for being in direct disobedience to an order from a superior officer. And we, of course, see, we all know the guy in the center, the boss, who says, does anyone have a suggestion that isn't ridiculous? An incredibly unsafe environment for people an unsupportive environment for people. And then we've got, in this instance, the chief marketing officers that we want to do something so innovative that no brand has ever done anything like it. And when the people have worked very hard to come up with creative ideas, his lack of courage shows, which sends them into um, back to the drawing board, but with a lot less energy and enthusiasm they had the first time around, right? And so as a result of that, Companies more often than not do innovation, not as an authentic exercise, but as theater. They check boxes, but there's no real heart in it. And so what I've seen over time is that men and women in a lot of large corporate environments lead lives of quiet desperation. They want to create. They very hungrily want to do something unique. But organizationally, they're not given the opportunity to do that. Okay. This is a very recent study from McKinsey that really bears this out. Workers, and this is literally about two months old now, right? Workers can be grouped into six archetypes along the satisfaction spectrum. And as you can see to the far right of this graphic, there's a very small number of employees that are considered to be thriving stars that are highly satisfied with their work environment and highly committed to delivering at a high level of excellence over time. And so what we've got now is about 40% that are on that satisfied world, but we have another 60%, including 30% that are just mildly disengaged, right? They're here, but they're not really fully bought in. And then you've got another 20% that are very much negative. And you've got an albatross that you're pulling behind the company, right? We have enough competitive challenges in the marketplace, enough competitive challenges with this economy that we're living through. And yet we're also dragging over half of our employees up the hill whenever we're trying to do something innovative. So how do we now change this equation? How do we reclaim our creative confidence, okay? And so there's a number of things that I can share, right? I taught a course last summer at Harvard, 15-week um, full semester course called Creativity Innovation. And at the beginning of the course, I had students write an essay as to why they wanted to take the course. And I was just blown away how many of them, even people working in Hollywood and creative industries, were lacking in creative confidence. And over the 15 weeks, we went through a series of exercises. We went through a capstone project. And we had an immersive weekend experience in Harvard Square. And we actually replicated the, um, the marshmallow challenge, although we used Legos. And we used serious games like Lego Serious Play. And by the end of the semester, people had reframed their mindsets. The, the exit reflections indicated a very significant shift in their own personal creative confidence, okay? So both on an individual level and at an organizational level, if we want to avoid innovation theater, if we want to avoid having over half of our workforce being checked out, then we have to collectively reframe our mindset, okay? The first thing we need to do is we need to look at each of our team members as individuals, and we need to know, we need to understand what makes their hearts beat faster. There was an incredible study by Harvard professor Teresa Amabile when she, she asked um, artists to submit 20 of their creations, uh, 10 of which were on spec and 10 of which came from their hearts. 
uh, and they were blindly submitted to a panel of experts who could then objectively identify which of their work was more creative. And I don't think it would come as a surprise to say the work that came from their hearts, not the work that came from a brief or a client requirement or a spec was most creative, right? So we've got to give the, we've got to know the people that work for us. We've got to know what's important to them. We've got to know what they'd love to do. And then we've got to give them the space to contribute fully from that place, okay? There's such an incredible bias towards sitting in windowless conference rooms and having groupthink, right? Coming up with PowerPoint after PowerPoint after PowerPoint to say, this is what we need to do. And this is why 90% of all products fail when they hit the market, because we're living outside of the real world. We're not working with our stakeholders. So my mantra is don't decide, design. And what that means is introduce human-centric design or design thinking. These are the skills that um, were first brought to the market by the Kelly brothers at IDEO. One of their very first clients, no surprise, was Steve Jobs and Apple. And they really set the pace for using human-centric design to come up with unique ideas, right? To not in any way, shape, or form look at something the way everyone else is, right? Just first principles thinking. And there was a very, very famous segment on Nightline, the news magazine Nightline in 1999, where for the first time we saw a window into the way that IDEO works and the way that they redesign something as basic as the kind of shopping cart that you would bring into a grocery store or a big box store, okay? So this has gained a lot of currency um, and it's an operating system or a mindset that is very, very powerful if it is embraced with authenticity, okay? The second thing is that we want leaders who understand that it's not about people having a 100% level of confidence that their answer is correct. This is Scott Cook, I think one of the most underrated executives in the history of Silicon Valley, who would say, we're no longer asking for your analysis to the 18th decimal point of accuracy. We're asking you, what is the fastest way to experiment and test that idea in the marketplace with real potential users, okay? And so, of course, an experiment means that something could turn out to be a positive or a negative outcome. But we need to recognize that there is no creativity, there is no innovation without failure. And yet we have to reframe our relationship with failure. Failure is not failing, failure is learning. And organizations that have been able to embrace this mindset culturally are so far ahead of the pack when it comes to their ability to be effective innovators, okay? S failure, celebrating failure, not celebrating, you know, the kind of failure that is based on just making a lot of mistakes, but celebrating failure because people were willing to take the risk to try something new in the marketplace is a very, very powerful modality. Okay, so the mindset should be, what if, why not, let's go. And I know that as I, with many of my international students who have come to the United States, right, they will say to me, you know, when I'm sitting in the United States with venture capitalists or, or investors, right, they're looking at the 20 ways that I can make this work. When I'm working with in VCs in my home country, um, they're looking at the 20 ways why this is going to fail. So it's a glass is half full versus glass is half empty mindset. And, and it's pretty clear what we need to do to be effective innovators, right? So Linda Hill, a professor at Harvard Business School, asked the question, if a problem calls for a truly original response, no one can know in advance what that response should be. Therefore, by definition, leading innovation is not about selling a vision to people who are then inspired to follow us, it is very different. It is about getting people to co-create the future with you. And you never know where that breakthrough idea is going to come from. In all of my startups, I have hired hundreds of my students 
people that were in many cases half of my age. And often they came in from, you know, to my companies without any industry experience. And yet it's amazing how often their ideas turned out to be really powerful ideas that we invested in. So give everyone the opportunity to create with you. Okay. So now how do we get creativity to go together in teams? Okay. This is a quote from David Kelly. Creative people are often portrayed as lone geniuses or rugged individuals. Think about Jeff Bezos. Think about Steve Jobs. But that's not the case. We have found that our best ideas result from collaborating with other people. From a make-a-thon or a hackathon or design sprint to multidisciplinary teams, creativity is a team sport. Okay. Stuart Butterfield, who was the founder of Slack, which was sold to Salesforce.com for the tidy sum of $17 billion. Collaboration is the opposite of a meek, deferential, submissive approach. It is leadership from everywhere. So how can you be a great leader and a great follower? And how do you know when to take on both of those roles? And individually be responsible for the health and performance of your teams. Okay. So the only way that's going to happen is if we engage employees. So let's remember that McKinsey chart of earlier. This was another finding within that study that said we're dragging half of our people uphill. These are some of the key factors that can help save companies a significant amount of losses, but also a significant amount of ineffectiveness, right? And I've just tried to outline those five where if we follow some of the principles that I'm suggesting, provide people more meaningful work, give them the ability to be more flexible in the workplace, be more supportive of their career development and advancement, be more supportive of them in what they do. And as leaders, be more caring and inspiring, right? We have the ability to completely flip this on its head. And so Brad Smith, the CEO of Intuit, who, and I quoted David um, uh, Scott Cook earlier, um, this is not lip service. Our mission, our values, and our culture of innovation sets us apart as a great place to work. Our 8,000 employees are innovators and entrepreneurs. Now, often you hear companies using terminology like this, and it's basically just whitewashing. This is absolutely authentic. The way that Scott and Brad and others have run the company is they are not the bosses. They are the chief mentors working with incredibly flat, small teams, cross-disciplinary teams that are given remarkable amounts of freedom to go out and find problems that are critical to their customers, ideate on solutions, come back to the leadership for coaching and mentorship, and go out and solve these problems on their own, right? This is as entrepreneurial a culture you can imagine at scale, okay? And so first of all, to be innovative, you need a culture of people that are willing. And if only half the organization is willing, as McKinsey, McKinsey indicates, Houston, we've got a problem. So there's got to be a shared sense of purpose and community that comes from having shared values and shared rules of engagement. We also have to be able to create. There's got to be some level of creative agility, right? We've got multidisciplinary people working together. There's some level of abrasion, right? All good ideas typically come from different ideas being mashed up together. And we need to be able to have creative resolution. We need leaders that are really able to not favor one employer or a group of employees who are the stars, but to embrace everyone in that organization who is bringing forth creative ideas, okay? Another very, very powerful way to do this, and I have seen this, right? I've, had, I've led over 200 of these hackathons, design sprints, innovation tournaments, solution funds, and the energy that this brings into an organization. This is basically telling your people, we value what you have to say. We value your ability to co-create the future with us. This is an incredibly powerful modality for organizations if it's done with authenticity. 
and if the ideas that come out of this are given some level of support and some level of resources in order to be brought into the marketplace. So this is a this is a creativity on steroids kind of exercise. Okay. So now let's talk about generative AI and let's make sure that we understand that we are living in a completely new world order. So just yesterday in my Sunday cartoons, I couldn't help but notice there were not one, but two comic strips that introduced the notion of generative AI. Here, the caption one on the right, and then here in a, a second one where um, in Pooch Cafe, we actually have um, the main character creating an image of himself using one of the text image creators and photobombing. So the fact that Gen AI has now entered the common consciousness in such a way that it is in the Sunday comic strip says everything I need to know about where we are. Okay. Now, about a month ago, I had to give an online presentation to about 8,500 employees of the global auto manufacturer known as Stellantis. And the entire point of my presentation was to help them understand how to leverage generative AI within their auto dealerships across the India, Asia Pacific region. And of course, it would have been impossible to find imagery that would be able to show me what the first auto dealers looked like in Mannheim, Germany, right? The Mercedes-Benz dealer in 1888, the first US auto dealer and the first Asian auto dealer, which was Yamaha in 1907. And so instead I worked with one of my students and using DALI, which is one of the text to image um, uh, tools that comes from OpenAI, I was able to create something that was very relevant and really communicated the vision of what I wanted to share. Last week, I wrapped up a marketing course at Harvard and the students were challenged to use generative AI to identify ways that they could create unique advantage for a specific brand. And in this instance, one of the teams used DALI again to talk about how they were going to allow Cartier, who is now really losing ground to Tiffany in terms of the digitally savvy Gen Z generation. They were able to, using these AI tools, to create extraordinary imagery. All of this was generated by DALI. The website, a lot of customization. They were able to show what the in-store um, experience looked like. And they were able to also create what some in-store events might be like. All of this was done as part of a class and all of this was generated with DALI, okay? So are we seeing an impact? Absolutely. Boston Consultant Group, 750 consultants were asked to move into two separate groups to do 18 different tasks. And a number of those tasks were creative tasks. Okay, And this was led by both Harvard Business School and Wharton. And what they identified is those BCG consultants using Gen AI on tasks, including creative tasks, finished those tasks 12.2% more of the time, completed them more quickly, and they completed them with a far higher, 40% higher quality result than those without. But what's even more powerful is they were able to take the lower 50th percentile of their employee base and improve their scores by nearly 50%. So if we go back one more time to that McKinsey slide from that survey about dragging 50% of our employees up the hill, um, imagine the positive impact you can get if your people are now conversant in generative AI tools this remarkable level of upskilling that's happening, okay? Now, let's talk about coming up with new ideas because you know creativity is all about new and creative ideas. And so we wanna be able to be idea machines, but I know that in my career, I've seen so many people that struggle in coming up with new ideas. They just don't have that creative confidence. Well, I wanna go back. So this gentleman, Neil Drossman, um, he just passed away. His obituary was in the New York Times yesterday. And people called him the idea machine. He was an ad writer and he was involved in dozens and dozens of award-winning ad campaigns. 
And apparently he just could not stop generating world-class ideas, but he is unique. But now we have the ability to level ourselves up to a Neil Drossman level of creativity. So there was a study recently, and there have been many of these. This one was done at Wharton, where they gave MBAs the task of coming up with 200 ideas for a new product that could be sold to a college student for less than $50. They asked ChatGPT to come up with 200 ideas. Then they went off and they did consumer intent to purchase surveys. And they've identified what were the 40 best ideas, the top 10% of ideas. And here's where it gets really interesting. Remember, these are Wharton MBAs. These are highly skilled, highly intelligent people. And yet 35 of the 40 ideas came not from the MBAs, but from ChatGPT, okay? There was another study done within MIT Executive Education where they were asking people participating, they gave a control group, Gen AI, and they said that almost 100% of the time, those that were using generative AI were asking a wider and a more diverse range of questions than the control group, which would allow them to explore ideas and solutions that would not have previously been considered, okay? So there was, I'm gonna reference one more study and we'll start to wrap up. So at the University of Missouri, there was a study called Augmenting Creativity Using Generative AI by Professor T.J. Teagan. And what he found was remarkable. He interviewed a thousand content creators, bloggers, podcasters, short form video producers. Two thirds of them were using tools for creative tasks. And over half said that generative AI enhanced their creativity and their productivity and allowed them to realize a much larger number of followers and to increase their income, okay? So this stuff works. So the, the bottom line is we're living in a new era. And if we want to remain on that regenerative golden path as a company, or if we want to remain on a regenerative path as an employee, then we need to recognize that what got us to where we are is not going to get us to where we want to go, okay? Each of us has agency. Each of us is a master of our own fate. And so I think it's pretty clear based on my remarks that we need to reorient our mindset. We need to update our skill set. And we need to also understand that there's a brand new tool set, generative AI, that's going to allow us to be more effective in the days and years ahead. Okay. So part of the uh, purpose of this course is to help people to reskill in the age of AI in order to be able to be very, very cutting edge in the kind of skills and capabilities that you need to be marketable and to be successful. Okay. So we're going to have to make friends with these chatbots and with these models, because it's pretty clear that they are definitely augmenting human capability. Okay. So let me stop there for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. This was wonderful. If you have a question, please submit it into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom bar, and then click on Q&A and type and submit your question there. We're going to give you a couple more minutes to submit your question, because as you're thinking of your question, I would also like to share a little bit about how you could continue to learn from Mike about these incredibly important and timely topics like innovation and creativity. So if you are as inspired as I am, and I always am, I'm inspired every time. One of my favorite things about these presentations is that Mike is always so up to date on all of the latest um, articles and research that a lot of times these are completely new presentations month to month, and I always learn something. And so if you, like me, are engaged and interested and excited and would like to continue to build your innovation toolkit, we hope you'll join us for our program called Innovation Leadership, which is a short course that helps you build the skill set for both yourself and your organization to be able to withstand all of these increasingly accelerated changes that all industries are experiencing. So first, I'm going to talk very briefly about why innovation matters. I think Mike has done an incredible job of explaining that already, so I won't spend too much time on this. But the numbers are still paint a really interesting and powerful picture. Across basically every KPI, innovation is critical. 
In terms of profitability, companies that are ranked as more innovative achieve a 2.6 times higher shareholder returns over five years. In terms of career advancement, 62% of CEOs identify innovation as a top three priority for their organization. So something they're actively looking to hire and promote. And then in addition, 82% of professionals prefer to work for companies that are known for their innovative culture. So it's also critical if you are in a position of trying to attract and retain talent. So we can see that across the board that innovation and creativity are critical skills. But, and there's a big but, only 21% 21 of executives report that their company does not have the expertise, resources, and commitment to pursue new growth successfully. So we have this huge gap between what is needed and what is currently possible. And that is why being innovative and creative and being able to help engender that within your teams and organizations is so crucial and why we created this program. So if you are a director and VP who is shaping your organization's strategy and products, or if you're a program and project manager and innovation team member leading the change at your organization, or if you're on the HR and culture side of things, fostering creativity in the workplace, or if you are here today and have expressed interest in these skills, this program is for you. The program is taught by our incredible faculty lead that you have got, gotten to know pretty well today. So I'm going to skip the slide for today. It is taught over four weeks and is a fully synchronous course, meaning that it is fully online, but it will all be taught live like today's masterclass was. So you'll all be on Zoom meetings where you can see everyone and participate both verbally and in chat. It will take place over um, between February 7th and February 28th. Every class is on Wednesdays from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. And there's only about an hour or two of reading in between each session. So the time commitment is relatively short, but the impact is really big. Each of those four weeks focuses on a specific tangible skill. In week one, you're going to learn from historic perspectives like you did today. We went through a couple of case studies today and you're going to build an entrepreneurial mindset. So often the first step to becoming more entrepreneurial and innovative is just changing that um, you know, framework of how you're thinking about your own work. In module two, you'll learn how to cultivate a creative culture so that it's not just you who's operating in this new, more creative space, but also your team. In module three, we're going to focus specifically on how to use chat GPT in your organization and this actually came directly from feedback from our last cohort. Our last cohort requested more focus on ChatGPT. And so we responded to that feedback by focusing an entire week on that topic. And then in module four, you're going to bring it all together and learn how to activate creativity to future-proof your team. How do you go from blank page to insights? By the end of the four sessions, the four weeks, these are the outcomes we commit to you. You will be able to future-proof your organization and career by harnessing lessons learned from historic pinnacle innovations, both the organizations that innovated very well and the ones that innovated very badly and in a way that helps us learn a lot. You will learn how to leverage disruptions to create innovation, innovative solutions that drive growth, value, and profitability. You'll update your knowledge on top trends in the innovation space, including and specifically ChatGPT in the workplace. And you'll cultivate a culture of continuous improvement in your organization so that the learning doesn't stay with you, but is distributed throughout your organization. And you don't have to take our word for it. Paul Sullivan, who's the Director of Business Planning and Analysis at Novartis, says, this curriculum is essential to anyone who wants to know what it takes to stay relevant in the coming years. The next step for enrollment, if you are interested, the enrollment deadline is January 24th, so it's coming up relatively soon. And in addition, we are running an early bird promotion now through January 7th for a 10% off that I hope you'll take advantage of. There's a short enrollment form that you just fill out and submit, and then you're in the class. And we'll send these slides out afterwards so you don't have to you know, memorize this link or take a screenshot or anything like that. So thank you so much for being with us today. And now we're happy to take questions on innovation, creativity, and or the program, whatever you have questions on. And I do see we do have some questions already. 
the first question for you, Mike, is how did the kids figure out the marshmallow challenge? It's not that they figured it out, right? They were fearless and that they weren't afraid to fail. And so, you know, the old Nike uh, mantra, just do it, right? They just decided that they would try to build something. If it fell down, they would try it again, right? There was no harm in failing where what you see with senior executives is they spend so much time discussing, debating, that by the time they the alpha male um, energy is uh, fully on display, they have very few minutes left to actually do the actual challenge itself. So it really is just, I think, very emblematic of, you know, when you have this mindset, you're not afraid to fail, roll up your sleeves and just start designing and you'll figure out whether it's going to work or not. Thank you. That's a great insight. The next question is, a lot of times we're kind of stuck in this place where we're balancing KPIs, measurable KPIs, and yep. also trying to be creative. How yep. do you make an impact on moving the needle towards more creativity? Yeah, I mean, there's no question. It, it, and it's going to depend, of course, on your role in the organization, right? But I would say that one of the things that you want to do is, is you want to tap into what is inevitably going to be a group of people that are somewhat frustrated by their lack of freedom to create. And you want to model behavior, right? So if you really feel like you want to be a champion and a thought leader for innovation, go out and find like-minded, like-valued colleagues that share that desire, share that intention, and begin to just demonstrate by action right? Go off on your own and start rolling up your sleeves and coming up with ideas, coming up with suggestions, proving to others, right? That you're able to do things in a way that maybe are different from what is currently in the, in the company operating system, but that you're demonstrating real outcomes and real results. So there's nothing like just showing results, okay? And sometimes that might mean a weekend project, an evening project, um, you know, some organizations, obviously, like Google, give people 20 percent of their time to work on things they're passionate about. But most of us don't have that luxury. So we're going to have to figure out how to carve that out. Thank you. I love that. And I love the idea of piloting some things so yeah. that you can then prove the results. I think that's really powerful. The next question is, what AI innovations have you been particularly impressed with in the last two to three months? And what news sources do you use to keep up with AI news? Okay, so let me let me answer the first question or the second question first. Um, I will tell you that I'm probably listening to 15 AI related podcasts every week. So to keep it simple for someone who's not living in this world, let me just suggest between McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, and Accenture, all of them have great podcast on innovation. And then there's nothing like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times who are both doing an outstanding job of keeping up on top of what, uh, what is happening in the world of innovation. Um, the Wall Street Journal also has every single day, twice a day now, something called their Tech News Briefing Podcast. Okay, so with those four podcasts and those two or three uh, reference sources, I'd say the you're, you're gonna be so far beyond the average person in terms of your understanding. Now, the second question, of course, is the most impressive um, applications I've seen. Uh, and, and let me just make sure that I'm understanding, because I could talk about the different um, algorithms and large language models that have come out, or I can talk about how they're being applied. Okay, so would the person be willing to just clarify? Is it the ones, because let me be very clear, right? ChatGPT uh, 4 is insanely powerful. I had given up on Bard until about a week ago when they released Gemini. And what I do every time I do a query is I literally run Bard, Claude, and ChatGPT side by side. And I do an ABC test to see which one is generating the most satisfying answers. And up until about a week ago, I had given up on Bard. But with their new Gemini large language model, it's become incredibly robust. And so, you know, in each instance, sometimes any one of the three might provide me with the most satisfying answer. And if you're looking to use text to image, there's no doubt that DALI has really taken a very strong lead 
over MidJourney and some of the other tools that are out there. If you are using, um, if you're working on your own, Adobe probably has the most robust policy uh, of making sure that you can't be sued for copyright violations if you're doing artistic creative work, right? They, there's a much more robust company and they put in place a lot of really interesting safeguards to keep someone from being sued. So I don't know if that answers the question that was asked, um, but feel free to refine the question. I'm let's just like a, I'm just like a chat bot. I'll regenerate my answer. Okay. <laughs> they right. did reply. They said that they were thinking about applied specifically. Okay. So I, I what I would say is um, some of the most powerful applications are in drug discovery. Mm -hmm. um, that you know may or may not be relevant to the you know to any individual on this call. But where is where are the applications the most universal? There's no doubt that sales and marketing are the single two most relevant functional areas where you're seeing executives in those areas using all of these different tools in a very powerful way. Marketing is probably the single most powerful. If you're doing any kind of product development work, if people are writing code, um, whether you're using Microsoft GitHub with Copilot or whether you're using ChatGPT, coding is another incredibly powerful application where people are starting to see 60 to 70% productivity improvements. And then anybody that is doing any kind of research or analysis, the ability to take a 40 page PDF put it into ChatGPT and have it summarized for you, or the ability to you know, download the transcript of a 90 minute podcast, put it into ChatGPT and have it summarize it for you. Um, to me, these are just incredibly universally appealing applications that any one of us can take advantage of, okay? And I will say this, there is an every single day, if not every single half day, there are new applications coming into the market, right? It would be impossible to be able to articulate all of them, but um, it's there's very little area where I've not seen impact today. Thank you. Um, staying on the Gen AI topic, yeah. next question is, do you think that Gen AI will equalize the creative potential among individuals in a team by elevating less creative people and making more creative people less relevant? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I don't think it will make the more creative people less relevant. There's no doubt that it will level up those people on the team that are less creative. But there is no reason why a creative person wouldn't want to invest time and energy into mastering these tools. So I really think it comes down to someone's mindset, right? Because I, you know, there's one student I've been mentoring at Babson. And he has devoted so much time every day and he has just become, he's, he's running an art gallery every week of new designs, right? And so if you're a creative type, there's no reason why you don't want to explore these tools. It's just like a professional athlete, right? Constantly upgrading to the latest equipment. Um, you know, I, so I, I don't see any reason why it would allow someone to lose skill or decline in their skills. You. <clears throat> the next question is, how would you creatively let C-suite know that going cheap and doing what has always been done can actually end up being expensive? How do how would I let them know? Obviously, that's a speaking truth to power discussion, but there is no substitute for presenting data, right? Is is to say, you know, we, you know, this is the old adage, you know, you've tried that 22 times and it's not worked once. How's that working for you? Right. <laughs> So I would say that if you have the ability to speak truth to power, obviously you don't go in and make an emotional argument. You show with data that, you know, these are the invest, the small investments we've made, and this has been the outcome. And, and, you know, today it's easier and easier to find relevant industry data. So how can you then compare your output, given the investment you've made to your peers who are succeeding and generate some return on investment calculations that should be pretty straightforward to make? Thank you. This is an amazing question. So I think this is the perfect one to end yeah. on. It's a two-parter. 
Yep. The first question is, is there a soft skill that you think is mandatory for entrepreneurs? And the second part is, is there one critical piece of advice that you would give to someone launching their own business? Okay, well, so so let me say this. The soft skill, I love it. And and if you want to be a founder, um, I would say, and, and I could choose a few, but you asked for one, coachability. Okay. Mm-hmm. One of the things that will turn off mentors and investors instantly is a young entrepreneur who feels that they know everything. And so if you are coachable, you will have the opportunity to, you know, earn the goodwill of the people, the, the stakeholders and the advocates around you. Okay. Now, the second question is, if there's one piece of advice for starting a new company, the message would be, you need to find something that you are genuinely passionate about. Entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. It is very hard. And you will ride the proverbial emotional roller coaster, whether you want to or not. And the only way that you're going to be willing to do that is if you have such an incredible sense of purpose and conviction, because you feel like, you know, you are meant to do this. You are meant to solve this problem or bring this product to market. So there's got, this can't in any way be about, I think I can make a lot of money. This is not an arbitrage play. This is a passion play. And that passion is what's going to fuel you through the inevitably challenging times that you're going to face. So that's my advice to you. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely incredible. Thank you for everyone who attended today, especially those of you who are on the East Coast and came during the evening. We're really grateful that you wanted to continue to learn and to build your skill set. Um, and thank you for the incredible questions that you all yeah. asked. These are really thoughtful and interesting questions. And thank you so much, Mike. I learned something from you absolutely every time. And I do always feel really energized and I feel ready to be more creative in my day-to-day life. And I think everyone here has also benefited from that resurgence of energy and the focus on really tangible strategies that we can take to infuse our workplaces with more creativity. So thank you so much. I'm so appreciative. I hope we get to see some of you in our virtual classroom in February. Thank you for taking time during the dinner hour, folks. And Allison, thank you as always for hosting me, okay? Have a great night, everyone. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye now.